good afternoon and it's a uh, pleasure to to be presenting on the very important topic of nitrosamines today so the way i thought about uh, talking today is to to talk about a little bit uh, general overview of nitrosamines and that will be brief i promise and but then dive right in to what is happening right now there have been really really important uh, developments in this field of uh, carcinogenic assessment of nitrosamines uh, recently within few weeks now and i would like to talk about that and also what multicase has been doing so far and what we are going to do in future that will also be few of the slides here uh, so with that let me start uh, so this is the carcinogenic assessment of nitrosamines all right uh, so a brief overview of what nitrosamines are. As you can see on the top, uh, there is a formula, which is the NNO functional group that uh, shows uh, the, the, from an organic chemistry point of view, what nitrosamines are. Um, and they are such a big concern because they are known to be very potent carcinogen in animal studies. And they obviously, uh, reasonably, they are anticipated to be human carcinogens. So they are placed as cohort of concern uh, according to the ICTM-7. So it's a very important uh, uh, type, group of compounds. Now, nitrosamines are found widely uh, around us uh, in the air, water, food, and drugs. So that's why they are such an important and concerning uh, chemicals. So why we are here? Because there has been cases of several popular medications uh, to be withdrawn from the market because of higher levels of nitrosamine contamination in them. And that has prompted uh, from last, I think, two years or so, a huge uh, movement in the field of pharmaceutical uh, companies, uh, research development, and overall uh, in the field of computational chemistry to be concerned about nitrosamines and what to do uh, to, to assess the risks of nitrosamines and how to find which nitrosamines are higher toxic and which are lower. Okay. Now, as let's talk a brief about how nitrosamines are formed. Uh, so this is the basic uh, reaction pathway uh, which leads to formation of nitrosamines. There are many other details, but let's talk about just just to be. Uh, on the brief side, let's talk about only two cases. Uh, one is the uh, case of secondary amines and tertiary amines. So both of these types of amines can form nitrosamines in the presence of uh, nitrosating agents, like for example, in the case uh, sodium nitrite or other nitrites. But uh, the requirement is, is to be in the acidic environment. So when there is a um, you know, acidic environment like inside our stomach or during the synthesis of drugs or during the shelf life of drugs, nitrosamines can form uh, with the, you know, by the reaction between the secondary amines and nitrosating agents. So this is the basic formula for uh, how the nitrosamines are formed. Now, in the medicines, uh, in the drugs, uh, this, uh, the nitrosamines can form by various uh, you know, ways. One of them is during the synthetic steps, like when the tetrazole ring is uh, synthesized, uh, like in the valsartans uh, or other drugs, um, or it can form by reaction between the raw materials and the drugs. Uh, uh, you know, like majority of the drugs have secondary or tertiary means. So therefore, if there is a contamination in the raw materials, even in package packaging materials, uh, between the, and if they have some nitrites, there can be formation of nitrosamines. In our stomach, nitrosamines can form uh, by precursors, which are the amines in our food, in the drugs, or, or and, and in the presence of nitrosating agents. And obviously, there is an acidic environment in the stomach. In the environment, nitrosamines can form by combustion, uh, the disinfection process of waters, and industrial contamination. That's also a huge concern, although we don't, don't talk, talk much about uh, environmental 
not so means now it is because we are totally engrossed in uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals, but uh, people have been concerned about nitrosamines for a very, very long time in the environment. Probably nobody paid any attention so far, but now uh, we should at least think about uh, the formation of nitrosamines and presence of them in the environment too. In the food, uh, nitrosamines can form by the precursors uh, from meat, fish, and other, other types of uh, food materials and uh, at higher temperatures. So these are the few uh, ways to form nitrosamines. So this is the most important part for today. Uh, how nitrosamines are metabol me metabolically activated because uh, lots of nitrosamines that are of concern today, they need to be activated metabolically. Uh, and in fact, all the cases that I'll be talking about today needs to be uh, need to be activated by uh, metabolism. So uh, uh, the basic process is shown by this this pathway, uh, and there are many other uh, you know side pathways are involved, but this is the main one where uh, the nitrosamines are first hydroxylated at the alpha position, as you can sh see by this arrow here. And it forms this alpha hydroxy nitrosamine, which then goes through several uh, steps of uh, spontaneous degradation. And at the end, it forms this DNA uh, adduct and this through this formation of this diazonium ion. So this diazonium ion is very reactive and it, it reacts with DNA to form a an adduct. So adduct is just nothing but a combination of a covalent bonding between the uh, diazonium ion and the uh, and the DNA. And basically what happens, the R2 group, which is the alkyl group, attaches itself with the DNA and forms a alkylating version of the DNA base. That is the basic mechanism. But this is the most important part where the alpha hydroxylation happens and it forms the uh, alpha hydroxy nitrosamine. So, uh, majority of the nitrosamines need metabolically activated uh, to, to become toxic or carcinogenic. That we have to remember because it will, it will come into play in later uh, steps. Uh, as I said, the first enzymatic step is the commonly uh, the alpha hydroxylation step. And this step, what we need to remember that the alpha hydroxylation step is, is affected, affected by electronic and steric factors that are present around this nitrosamine moiety, you know. So this is going to be extremely important when we are trying to uh, find out if a nitrosamine is going to be more toxic or less toxic or medium toxic, whatever it is. And that obviously is important because we want to find out what would be the acceptable intake limits of nitrosamines. Now, there are different types of nitrosamine that can, that can form in the drugs. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it can it can have small nitrosamines like NDMA. Why I want to show these two types of nitrosamines because uh, they have different requirement or different type of data available for them. So when small nitrosamines are present, uh, for example, NDMA or NDEA, um, at least we have animal carcinogenicity data available for them. You know because they have been tested really vigorously and in the past. So we have a lot of data available for them. However, that's not the case when NDSRIs are there. So those are the, the compounds where the drug itself converts to an isomer inversion. And like, for example, I showed these two examples. There are many, many, many examples. Um, you know, so the amine part in the drug gets converted to nitrosamine moiety. So these are NDSRIs. They are important because we do not have pretty much no data available for them. Um, no data means no animal carcinogenic data. So that's why we are focused on it. Now, gradually, we have started seeing uh, some data that is been coming out uh, from regulatory agencies or some other people. So that's a very good news, but uh, still we do not have much data. That's why they are special. 
So what are the different types of computational approaches for knife swimming that we, we can talk about? Since we are computational uh, people uh, in multi-case, this is what I would like to talk about. Um, there are other concerns, of course, like what kind of in vitro in, or in vivo assays that we could design, but that's not my area of expertise, but so that's why I would like to talk about the computational approaches uh, for assessment of carcinogenicity of nitrosamines. So we can build QSAR models directly using the TD50 values of the small nitrosamines that we have. You know, so they are like around 100 nitrosamines and for which data is available, so we can build the QSAR model. But the problem is, which I'll talk about later, is that the data is small. So this kind of approach is usually not very promising. So it we, we have uh, not much way to build such QSAR models. So this is one of the things that we use today. You know, so structural titillation te techniques to identify activating or mitigating features. Uh, in nitrosamines. Or we can find out related or similar analogs of surrogate chemicals that present our NDSRIs uh, that that represent in a in a proper way the steric and electronic factors that are present in the uh, NDSRI. And we can use them to as an analogy to detect to, to assess the carcinogenicity of our own query chemical. OK, so that's another very promising approach that uh, are being used today. So that's why I, I highlighted them. There are other things like, for example, you know, uh, what are the um, factors that affect the metabolic activation? We have done some, some interesting work in that area. I'll be talking about it later on. And quantum chemical calculations to assess the reactivity of uh, nitrogen. That is also one of the important things I have not highlighted that doesn't make it less important. But the problem with quantum chemical calculations that is that not many people have expertise. And when I say not not many people, including myself, uh, I do not know how to perform quantum chemical calculations and they also usually take longer time and they are very specific requirements to run them. That doesn't make it bad. It just is difficult to use, but that's one of the interesting approach. Now, what are the challenges currently we are facing uh, in the, in terms of computational assessment of uh, nitrosamines? So, first thing is we do not have much data. You know, uh, there are small sets of uh, nitrosamines for which we have some animal carcinogenicity data, but sometimes ma many of those data is not robust, you know, so the statistical significance of those studies are not good. Some of them are, but many of them are not. So that poses another challenge. And majority of the data that is available is for those nitrosamines that are small in structure. And that's why they do not represent very well the NDSRIs that are formed um, from the drugs. You know, so that's these are important challenges that we face. There are some others, but these are the most important thing that I can think of right now. Um, another challenge I think I forgot to tell that is uh, the AIMS test that we usually use for uh, the regular AIMS test for any other type of mutagenic impurities. Uh, regulatory agencies say that that's not enough to detect the every nitrosamines. So there has been a development in that regard too. Uh, you know, I'll talk about it later on. So that's another challenge which actually prompted this whole problem. So let's talk about what has been the approach from the regulatory agencies so far. You know, because that's very important right now. So, so far, Till a few weeks ago, and even now, the surrogate based structure active relationship methods were the main approach. So, you know, um, we have developed a lot of, uh, appro you know, methodologies or, or case studies where a, an NDSRI is evaluated by checking out similar chemicals that represent its, chemi you know, 
electronic and uh, static factors. That has been the uh, approach so far, but something happened a few weeks ago. On July 7th, EMA published an update uh, in the question and answers for their market authorization document. And that gave a very interesting and very nice approach for the nitrosamine evaluation. I would like to talk about in detail about that. But in that document, uh, besides other things, there are many other things which is which is really important, which caught my eye are these three things. So the, the first is number 10 question, and you can you can uh, find that document out. It's, it's widely available. I'm sure all of you have it already now. So in the number 10 question, um, there is an update which talks about uh, what type of limits to be applied uh, on nitrosamines for medicine products, you know. And the main fo computational focus is, is the development of something called CPCA, which is, which stands for carcinogenic potency categorization approach uh, for nitrosamines. And that I'm going to talk about in more detail. But the CPC approach is seems to be a very promising approach uh, right now to go on, you know. And the last thing is that they also published an appendix which gave a list of almost 90, around 90 chemicals, uh, nitrosamines, for which they have already gave the acceptable intake limits. You know, so these three things are the most important part of this update. There are other things in that document, um, but you know, this is for today. This should be our concern. So, in that document, how to establish an AI or acceptable intake limit for a nitrosamine? Uh, I would like to talk about that a little bit. So. The first thing that they say is that if any nitrosamine that you are trying to evaluate, if substance specific animal carcinogenic data is available and that is robust, you should use it to, to, to derive the AI, you know, using the TD50 value of that carcinogenic study or the NDSRI. If it is available, sometimes you are trying to evaluate small nitrosamine, like I said before. So if you are trying to evaluate, say, NDMA or NDA or NMO or something for which you have uh, robust data, use it. Use its TD50 value to derive the, um, you know, AI limit. Or look it up in, if probably already they have published it. However, the most interesting part, what happens when sufficient animal carcinogen data is not available, which is with majority of the cases, right? So for all the NDS, NDSRIs pretty much. So in that case, the carcinogenic potency categorization approach, this thing should be, uh, should be used. Let me see if I can have the pointer here. Yeah, so this thing is the first thing to consider, number one. However, there are other ways too. So suppose, you know, they also publish the requirements for enhanced AIMS testing. So please don't ask me what enhanced AIMS test is. I understand that it has, it has, uh, it is a little bit more advanced test. There are some, you know, change conditions so that it can catch more and more nitrosamines. And if that gives you a negative outcome, you can directly control it at the uh, 1.5 microgram per day, you know, which is non, non cohort of concern uh, intake limit. However, if the substance is positive in that AIMS test, then you can go for AI establishment using the first thing, the carcinogenic potency uh, CPC approach, or you can use a surrogate based approach. So negative is fine, but if it is positive, go for CPCA or surrogate based approach. So surrogate approach is not dead yet. It is it is still very, very uh, important in, in the in the determination of AI and I'll talk more about it. Uh, and the third is directly using uh, surrogate approach. If you can find a good surrogate with robust carcinogenic data. Uh, and and. 
of course you have to use principles of structured relationship and read across to determine the td50 value uh, of your compound or ai of the compound to be more specific uh, you can also perform a in vivo mutagenic study which are time taking and expensive but if you do so and if you get a negative uh, 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 result from it you can directly control the nitrosamine as a non mutagenic impurity if not if it comes out positive you can use option one which is cpca or you can op use option three which is the read across using a surrogate so the the uh, establishment of ai is pretty straightforward uh, and and i i hope that majority of the people would would go for the cpca and surrogate this approach you know uh, but you know you can still use enhanced aim test in few cases if if needed I just think it's, yeah. So what is a robust animal carcinogen data? Let me talk a little bit about that because uh, it is important. Uh, if we are talking about the establishment AI, we need to know what is a robust animal carcinogen data. And this table I took from uh, uh, my good colleague uh, and friend, Dr. Joel Burku from Gilead Sciences. And his, in his paper, he defined what a robust carcinogen data is. So only those studies that has used three or more dose groups, well-defined methodology, 50 animals or more, and administered the compound daily, um, administered over the lifespan of the animal, daily dosing. So few United uh, States have robust data like NDEA, or NDMA or N more, which is morpholine, nitrosol morpholine. But there are other types of data also, like limited but sufficient and insufficient. You know, you can look it up, but this is the robust data. That's what the uh, Q&A from EMA talks about. Okay, let's move on. So let's now dive directly into the CPC approach that I talked about, you know, what it is. So this approach assigns a potency category to the nitrosamine and with a corresponding acceptable intake directly. Uh, so that's very important. So how does it do that? It does that by an assessment of activating or deactivating structural features present in the molecule, which they have learned or we have learned basically from the beginning by using surrogate analysis, structure relationship, etc. And studying the data using expert knowledge. Uh, so on that basis, we have identified a lot of activating and deactivating structural features, and those has been used by this approach to, to determine the potency category and the acceptable intake limit. And as I said before, it actually assumes that the alpha hydroxylation mechanism is the primary me metabolic activation for the responsible of the carcinogenicity of the nitrosomyces that, that is in question. So these are what I'm listing here are the fundamentals of the CPC approach. Uh, it also it considers if there are fa structural features in the molecule that can increase the clearance of the nitrosomyces by other biological pathway, you know. So if there is a feature present that uh, clears up or excretes uh, the nitrosamines and makes it detoxified, other than the mechanism than alpha hydroxylation, that's also an important thing because if something doesn't go through alpha hydroxylation, it will not become toxic, at least DNA reactive, uh, if some other detoxification mechanisms are present, you know. So that all, it, it also considered that one. And this approach is conservative. So they do not uh, include everything that we know so far, only those that are well established. There is not much confusion about them and there is enough evidence present. Only those factors they have included. And this is approach is expected to be further refined and expanded. So what we know today, uh, 
I, I think and I hope at least, and it will be uh, expanded later on, and also they will add more and more features uh, and make it more adjusted to, to uh, the requirement. Okay, so that's what the category CPC approach is. Now, let's talk about the scope of CPC. Remember, there is a, there was a scope of, for ICHM7. Um, so some of the chemicals that were not included in uh, ICHM7. Similarly, there are a few things, few compound types of nitrogen that are not included and excluded from the CPC approach. So the first thing is, the nitrosamine that we are trying to evaluate using CPC should have carbon atoms on both sides of the nitrosamine group. So in this case, when I say both sides, so this is nitrosamine, this is one alpha carbon, another alpha carbon. These both of them should be carbon atoms in order for this approach to be applied. The second important thing is that those nitrosamines that has a carbon atom on the alpha position that is a heteroatom is not included in this approach. So all these nitrosamine ureas, nitrosamides, nitrosaguanidines, which I listed here, as you can see, they are not included, including those that have a heteroatom bonded directly to nitrogen, because that means one side of the nitrogen do not have a carbon atom. So these, these are all excluded. They are not, you cannot evaluate these compounds uh, carcinogenicity using CPC approach because they are they work differently. They actually directly bind with DNA instead of getting alpha hydroxylated. So they have a different mechanism. They are not cohort of concern. Also, if the nitrosamine is embedded directly in the in an aromatic ring like this, uh, they are not included. They are excluded. So. For example, this NDSRI, which is n so zolmitriptan, will not be evaluated using um, CPCA. Uh, they are not cohort of concern. Okay, so this is the scope of CPC. Hopefully, it's uh, clear enough. Now, let's go to additional aspects of CPCA. Important things. So, it when you apply the CPCA, it puts the uh, nitrosamine in one of the five potency categories, one, two, three, four, and five. So you will get out like one of the categories. The second thing is it gives one of the four AI limits. So some of the categories have same AI limit. So these are the four different types of AI limit that can come out, 1500, 400, 118 nanogram per day. So why it is important? Because before, usually the regulatory agencies will by default, assign an 18 nanogram per day limit, uh, which is which was the most, you know, most problematic part of this whole story. So that is now getting relieved a little bit, a lot. And we gotta keep in mind that the CPC approach actually is executed or or implemented for every nitrosamine group that is present in the uh, NDSRI. So if a nitrosamine has more than one um, uh, nitrosamine functionality, the CPC approach will be uh, applied to each one of them. And the one that will give the lowest uh, AI limit will be used for the whole compound. So the most potent nitrosamine uh, center will be assigned uh, to the whole compound. OK, so this is important, uh, this part. Now let's directly go to the steps of CPC calculation, how they are, uh, how they are executed. So they have given a very interesting and nice flowchart, and you start from the beginning, you know, um, and just go one after another. And the moment you find the answer is yes, you will go to the right side and stop. Otherwise, you just keep continue and end up in a proper place. And every step has a corresponding category uh, number and, a, and an AI limit, you know, and, and the top, the AI limits are higher and the 
bottom, the AI limits are lower. That means at the top you have uh, less potent carcinogens and the bottom you have strong and highly potent carcinogens. So let's now uh, think a little bit deeper and see what actually these steps are doing. So the first three steps basically is trying to determine if there is a steric hindrance or absence of steric hindrance around the alpha carbon of, of the nitrosamine. That's what the first three steps are doing. And the last four steps are basically if there are no steric hindrance or less steric hindrance, then how can we assign a uh, further refine the uh, AI limit? You know, and it, it has very distinct uh, parts. So basically it contains three things. First thing is to calculate the score for the alpha hydrogens and I'll, I'll speak more about them. And second one, is to calculate a score for the deactive features if they are present. And the third one is to calculate a score for the activating features. And then you just add all these, you know, uh, three features, alpha hydrogen, deactivating and activating and get the potency score. And the moment you get the potency score, score you'll immediately get the AI limit. Okay, so these are the three things that happen once you pass the number one. And keep in mind that, you know, for many nitrosamines, you you may not have all the three. You may have only one. You know, usually the calculating of the alpha hydrogen score is is happens for every one of them. But these two P are depends on the specific nitrosamines. Okay, so this is what this uh, the steps of the calculations are. You know, a very simple workflow, and you know, determine the steric hindrance by counting the alpha carbons, and then go to the next one where they determine a potency score. OK, and if there is a steric hindrance present, then the potency score is in you know, category five and the AI limit is automatically 1500 nanogram per day. You know, OK, so now let's go to the first thing. How to count the alpha hydrogen? Extremely easy thing to do. You just keep in mind that these are the two alpha hydrogens, which are the two sides of the nitrosamine group. And you just count how many uh, hydrogens are connected. Keep in mind that uh, carbon has, you know, I do not want to insult anybody by saying this, but uh, uh, carbon has four valences, so it is pretty easy to calculate how many hydrogens are there. So you got to count separately on these two carbons. You know, you count first one and then the second one. And as I said before, this count is used for determining the first three steps, which are the steric hindrance, as well as it is used in the computing of the uh, potency score. And uh, in, 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 in the potency score calculation, there's the first step, which is the calculation of the alpha hydrogen score, where the counts are used. And you can actually get three possible scores, one, two, and three. So how do they do it? You know, so here are the different examples, basically it covers all of them, you know. So if you have zero hydrogen on one and two hydrogen on the other, you will receive a score three uh, and so on. And as you can see that score one means two and three or two and two. So what it actually means, it means that if there are no hydrogen on one side, uh, basically, it means there is a huge steric hindrance and you get a higher score and higher score means lower potency. So more deactivation. So, you know, so these are the three cases where there is a steric hindrance on one side of the. Uh, you know, nitrosamine. But you might ask. You have same counts in these two cases, zero to zero to. But then why one of them gets score three and why another one gets score two? There is a simple reason for it. In the case of score two, you have two hydrogens on one of the carbons, but that's a part of the, an ethyl group. So this is a ethyl group, CH2, CH3, so two carbon atoms. And these tend to be higher potency as compared to if it is a, if the carbon chain is a little bit longer, 
and the methyl group is not directly connected to the alpha carbon. So in and the the reason is behind the hydroxylation metabolism. So in these two cases, the hydroxylation will happen easily, more easily on this carbon, alpha carbon, as compared to this alpha carbon. That's why there is a difference with these these scores here. Okay, so these are the different uh, scores that you obtain when you count the al alpha hydro hydrogens on the alpha carbons. Okay, hopefully it's clear. Uh, now let's go to the how to calculate the deactivating feature scores. So what are the deactivating features? So deactivating features are those structural features in in the molecule that tend to reduce the carcinogenic potency uh, of the nitrosamine. And in this case of CPC approach, you calculate the scores from all the features that are present and add them to get a final score. OK, so these are. Some of the structural features. And you just add. So here the, these numbers are represent uh, the um, score or contribution of each feature. So if you have a carboxyl group present anywhere in the molecule, you add plus three. That means this is a huge deactivating feature. Why? As I said before, I think when carboxyl group is present, it actually, the, the nitrosamine undergoes a phase two metabolism instead of going to the phase one alpha hydroxylation, and it, it, it is easier to conjugate it. And before it, it gets cleared up from the body, before it can exert its nitrosamine, uh, its, its carcinogenic effects. That's why there is a big uh, plus three. And these are all different types. You know, rings usually usually decrease the uh, type of uh, you know the potency of the nitrosamines. So they receive depending on the what type of rings, either plus three, plus two, or plus one. This one is presence of long chains on both sides of the nitrosamine, uh, and Keep in mind, not only you have to have a long chain, but you know the the chain atoms should not be embedded in the ring, one ring, more than four atoms. So long chains around in the both sides of the nitrosamine mean, decreases the potency to a small degree. Okay, there are a few more. Uh, you know, so electron withdrawing group um, present on one side, both sides. Hydroxyl group present on one side or both sides, they receive different types of uh, scores. Um, so these electron withdrawing groups are the are the electronic effects. They reduce the chance of uh, the reactivity of the nitrosamine uh, by different ways, and that's why they they are considered as deactivating features. So these are the features we we discovered by performing structure activity relationship. So it is very nice to see all of them coming into play. Uh, there are activating features too, but they increase the potency. So activating features are those that increase the carcinogenic potency of nitrosamines. And in, in here also, you, you add the scores from all the features. So there are basically only two right now. Uh, good news for us. And as you can see that the numbers are negative, so they increase the potency. So one is the benzyl group where a benzene ring or an aromatic ring is attached with a carbon atom uh, to the nitrosamine. So alpha carbon, and then there is a direct connection with an uh, aromatic ring. So that is the uh, activating feature. Or if there is a methyl group attached to the beta carbon, so beta carbon is uh, is are those that are next to the alpha carbon. So if there is a methyl group, it usually activates uh, or increase the chances of toxicity of the nitrosamines. So these are the two activating features. OK. So what happens when we profile the NDSRIs using the CPC approach? You know, we want to see that. Uh, at least I wanted to see that. Uh, and what I did, I took 6,277 possible NDSRIs from our, you know, from one of the databases that has been published. And we evaluated all of them using this approach. And let's see what are the different types of AI limits 
we get from them. And I just made a simple pie chart. As you can see that good news, a lot of them, 33% falls under the 1500 nanograms per day. Uh, some are 400 nanograms, 23%. So more than half are either 1500 or 400. Uh, you know, some goes to 18, 18%, but still there is 26% of the NDS that I did, which fall under 18 nanogram per day using this, um, uh, you know, CPC approach. So I hope that we'd be able to use um, surrogate approach to determine uh, if they are higher limit uh, or something else, you know, uh, like uh, uh, an enhanced AIMS test or something to find out if they are truly 18 nanogram. I'll show an example later on. So this is still a problematic part, but you know, that's going to happen. Uh, we cannot expect that everything will fall under 1500 nanogram per day. Okay, but this is the picture that I got from 6,277 NDSRI analysis using the CPC approach. And I'm happy about it. And so, you know, I just wanted to show this thing. So let's directly go into a case study. n nitroso vertiox setting. Here is the structure of the uh, NDSRI. Here is the nitrosamine group, and that's the structure. The, when I tried this um, NDSRI with our QSAR flex to perform a surrogate-based SAR type of um, study, I could not find a good surrogate with robust animal carcinogenic data. So I cannot use a surrogate based approach here, just to be clear, you know. So then I use the CPC approach. Now remember, just a few days back, this would, would have been a dead end uh, because the moment you would not be able to find a surrogate, proper surrogate with proper data, uh, you know, you, you basically hit a wall. Now it's no, that case no more. You know, we have more benefits coming out. So let's try the uh, CPC approach. And as I said before, first thing is to count the alpha hydrogens. In this case, there are two hydrogens on both the sides. And it receives score one. Okay. And then we go for uh, deactivating features and activating features. So no activating features are found, only deactivating features. And the deactivity features is the n nitroso group in five or six membered ring, which is this ring, you know, here. And that gives a plus two score. And now we can add these two scores. That gives it number three, which leads to assignment of potency category three, and the AI limit is 400 nanogram per day. Now this potency category three, uh, you know, this number three doesn't come from this thing. Keep in mind, it just happens to be this in this case that it, they are the same number. But, uh, you know, this thing has nothing to do with uh, the exact value. It just potency scores leads you to the potency category. OK, but for this, the AI value is 400 nanogram per day, even after we did not get a um, proper surrogate with proper data, carcinogenic data. OK, so let's go to the second case study. And in this case, uh, this is the um, drug n nitroso atomoxetin, and uh, this is actually present in the appendix of uh, of uh, uh, EMA Q&A. Both of the case studies are present in their appendix, so you can look it up actually. Uh, for this drug, when I use the CPC potency category, it gave me 18 nanogram per day. You know, very potent. Now that made me wonder, can we get a surrogate? And yes, I did. And when I use QSurfrex, which is our computer program to uh, get the surrogates, uh, I got a good surrogate with uh, 100 nanogram per day limit, uh, you know. And this surrogate has robust carcinogenic data. And this is the surrogate which is called NNK, nicotine-based nitrosamine ketone. It has a robust carcinogenic data, and the gold TDFT value is 0 
and last at 80 level is 0.142 and we went i think they went with the um, most conservative value and that's why the uh, you know using this formula we got 100 nanogram per day limit and just for your information that's exactly the uh, ai limit reported in the ema and with the exact same surrogate so here is a case where we have used where the CPCA did not give proper um, value and surrogate based AI with the experimental data, we get better value. You know, so it's perfectly useful and, uh, you know, allowed by the regulatory agencies. So these are the only two case studies that I wanted to show you. One using purely CPC approach and another one is using the surrogate based approach to perform the uh, AI derivation. Now, for that drug, the, the previous one, uh, atomexetin, uh, NDSRI, this this screenshot that I got from case, uh, I'm sorry, QSR flex, uh, ND, uh, you know, carcinogenicity module, and as you can see that it gives you various uh, um, analogs or surrogates, and this is the one that I took, which is the robust value. So, you know, uh, it's a very good, nice example of uh, using surrogate based approach so in this context i want to talk about more about importance of local similarity so local similarity is the is the using of structural features around the nerd swing moiety and that's what they have used actually so why because local similarity me measures uh, you know the the importance of features around nerd swing moiety which have more impact on the uh, dna reactivity and the um, global similarity, which takes into consideration the full molecular structure, do not give proper analogs. Okay, so the, here's an example where we got, this is NDSRI and these are the analogs. And as you can see that the analogs has, you know, if, if you just focus on the nearby features, these all three analogs, they look very different, but they have very same features, you know, and uh, you can use the, it to, to get the uh, TD50 value and AI limits. I just wanted to mention this thing. And this paper we published in 2019, a long time ago, uh, when uh, nobody was worried about nuts means, but we were already using local similarity to perform ICHM7 type of analysis. So I considered that that paper was very important for us because it lead to various other things. Uh, when nitrosamine became important. So the QSR flex, let me talk about a little bit about multi-case products that we have in regard to uh, nitrosamine. So we have- uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Suman, can yes. you stop for a moment? Yes. Uh, if anyone Please. wants to ask any question, with, uh, so far, whatever he has spoken, you're most welcome to do it, otherwise he'll proceed. Now. You want him to proceed further? Okay, thank you. I think I think let me finish and then then we can talk a little bit. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. So here we have uh, you know since uh, I'm talking about different methodologies, this is very important because QSR Flex is uh, our nitrosamine evaluation program right now, and it, it contains a module called nitrosamine suit and which, which contains more than one module, but it has a database of 194 nitrosamine surrogates, which is recently updated and increased from 135 surrogates. It also contains AMS metastasis database for 469 nitrosamine surrogates. And it, it also contains LOCP module and a water solubility module. So this, was, this is our current uh, nitrosamine evaluation program. And it is becoming very important, um, not only right now, but it has been a very important guideline for us to develop these QSAR and SAR uh, strategies. So what is our role so far? Did Multicase just sit uh, there um, quietly and see uh, what is happening in the industry or did we play some role? I think we did play some role, an important role. Uh, we may not be the very vocal ones, but we did play some important role, and I want to highlight a few of them. 
The first thing is that we were the first one to develop the tool for the surrogate base. Nobody else did that. And we released it uh, in June 2021, which was the early, uh, you know, very early stages of nitrosamine problem. So this was the first tool in the industry. And we developed this tool with, by very closely working with FDA and the experts in the field to, to determine, you know, surrogate based technique. And it is still under um, use. And me, my colleague, uh, Rustam, he actually developed uh, this high quality curated nitrosamine surrogate database, not only using uh, the gold database, CPDB, um, uh, you know, LASA database, but also a lot of compounds from other literature that very few people actually know. So now it contains 194 compounds, as I said before. And we developed the first local similarity methodology approach and we published the results. Okay. And we also developed a new methodology to perform to find out what will be the uh, you know the pot you know not potential potential of alpha hydroxylation of NDSRIs and we just published a very important paper a few days back a few weeks ago actually so these are our contributions so far few of the contributions and I'm very happy about this so. Here is an announcement. We will be releasing a new nitrosamine evaluation tool in very near future. And that will actually include a completely automated way to perform the CPC approach. And that will work alongside with the uh, nitrosamine uh, surrogate based technique that we already have, that so many of you already have. So we'll be adding this thing so that you don't have to find out what are the number of hydrogens, which is the easy thing to do, but other things like uh, you know, if there is a deactivating feature, if there is an activating feature, and how to compute the final AI values and the potency categories. So this is going to be an important tool very soon. We have already made a lot of progress, but we it is in the testing phase, and we will be developing a nice interface so that you can use it uh, in in effective way. So this is a announcement from our side. So what are the publications that we did? So one of the things I just talked about is this paper, which is a computational prediction of metabolic alpha hydroxylation, uh, which I consider a very exciting uh, work from our side, which gives us tremendous opportunity to, to go beyond uh, what CPCA is included. And uh, I hope that this paper will become um, more useful in future. We also published uh, in you know, with uh, FDA people, particularly with Naomi and Govind Raj, uh, a very important poster in SOT 2022 poster. And, you know, this paper is also, we should not forget, because we published into 2019, but it became a guideline for us to develop the local similarity approach. So these are a few of the publications that we did. And, uh, you know, I'm pleased about, at least we have some publications. So we identified using that paper, this paper, uh, the research work that we did, we identified some more activating and deactivating features. And I hope that in future, regulatory agencies will recognize at least some of them. They already, the, the activating and deactivating features that uh, the CPC approach is talking about, you know, I already found it using uh, our analysis approach. And here are the, few things that CPCA did not cover. And, you know, beside finding completely new features, we also found out that there are certain things that, uh, that uh, are worse to keep in mind. For example, you know, in the CPC approach, they talk about five or six member ring when nitrosamine is present. What I found was that when there is a um, nitrogen on fourth position, it is much more deactivating as compared to if you don't have one, you know. So these are some of the things that uh, I noticed. And in the activating feature, also same story. The benzyl carbon atom is placed under one group in CPC approach. But when when I you know, calculated the potencies, what I found is that 
there are different types of benzyl groups. For example, you know, the position of nitrogen on the aromatic ring is very important. This thing is much more toxic as compared to this one. You know, so this one is much more toxic as compared to a simple benzyl group. And there is another one, new one, this activity feature. So we did a lot of important studies and we found um, very new, you know, structure to relationship that nobody was able to find from using these small nitrosamines. So I'm really excited about these findings. Okay, so let me just recap. So few mechanistic considerations are extremely important. The first one is potential of alpha hydrosylation. So it is not that, you know, the moment CPCA has been published, we forget the science behind it. You know, it is going to be playing more important role in future. The potential of alpha hydrosylation is the primary important thing. Second thing is the reactivity of the diazonium species. So the diazonium cation that forms at the end, how much reactivity is. And just keep in mind that these are the principles that CPC approach also used to derive the rules in the first place. Other clearance pathway, uh, as I mentioned before, that carboxylic group anywhere in the molecule, that comes from this consideration. DNA repair mechanisms. How CPCA was influenced by this? Remember that deactivating feature where I talked about the longer chain of five or more carbon atoms on two sides of the nitrous ring? That this is actually, those are easy to repair. And that's why they receive more, uh, you know, they, they have been treated as deactivating features. And bioavailability. You know, so from a point of view of uh, reactivity of the diazonium species, these are the order of reactivity. So methyl group is the very reactive, and if you have a allyl group or a butyl group, it is lower active. You know, so this is uh, coming from this paper, uh, Manso et al. And the DNA repair mechanisms, uh, you know, I read it from the Farrar et al. paper. So these are the important considerations right now. And with that, I would like to conclude, and I I want to thank. Uh, uh, the Cedar Group, uh, with whom we have uh, RCA uh, Research Collaborative Agreement. I am very thankful to my colleague uh, Rustam for developing the database and working closely with me. My colleague Radha, um, she worked with me tirelessly on writing very complex uh, computer code. Uh, my colleague Joel Burku from Gilead Sciences had been a very important uh, collaborator with us, um, not only in supporting QSARFLEX, but also uh, having important discussions with, uh, with us in terms of how to move on and how to perform these studies. And of course, I'm thankful to you, all our customers, for their great support throughout past many, many years. So with that, I would like to thank you. And here is my... Um, uh, you know, email address, and I would like to thank you for your patience uh, at the end of the day, probably. And uh, please go ahead with any kind of questions you got.